morning, good afternoon, good evening, Y Whales, wherever in the world you are today. Uh, so today is February 2nd, 2023. Bitcoin is sitting right around 23,800. Um, and really, despite kind of the, the concepts of like, hey, crypto's over, you know, Q, Q4 last year was the end of that. It, it had a good run. Uh, Bitcoin's going to zero. Uh, we, we've seen a, a nice, healthy rally. And so we're really excited to kind of see, again, just life coming back into the, the cryptocurrency market and overall Web3 blockchain ecosystem. Um, but, but, you know, not everyone really cares about cryptocurrency. And I think that a lot of people really started to understand that the most cryptocurrencies are nothing but hopes and dreams. Uh, the, the core concept around blockchain is not around hopes and dreams. It's around security, immutability, trust, and a variety of other uh, adjectives and, and nouns that I could throw out right here. Uh, but most importantly, I think that we're really seeing the rise of RWAs, real world assets. And that really is, to me, one of the most exciting things. Uh, as a disclosure, I own a residential uh, real estate brokerage, title company, mortgage company. Um, so I'm just ecstatic to have our guest today, uh, Roofstock, with Sanjay and Jeff, uh, two of the leading tokeniz tokenizers of, of residential uh, homes. Um, and you guys, I'm sure, have had a really long road to kind of get to where you are today. But before we start with that, I, I want to thank uh, my, my co-host, Mafia Mike, for coming in and hanging out with me yet again. Um, but Sanjay and Jeff, let's kind of go back real quick to um, you know where you guys came from and, and how you got here today. Sanjay, if you don't mind kicking us off. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've had about 25 years uh, working uh, mostly in financial services, a lot of product work. Um, I did spend about five, six years as an entrepreneur building um, financial models for banks and uh, private equity uh, companies that were looking to evaluate on balance sheet um, assets, mostly cash flow bearing assets like loans, uh, commercial loans, residential loans, consumer loans, and so on. And then after that, I also spent about five years as a lower middle market investment banker structuring various uh, debt and equity uh, uh, private capital market transactions. Uh, when I came into Roofstock about roughly three and a half years back, um, what really intrigued me and interested me was this was an asset class across the U.S. Um, when you think about uh, rental properties, you know, typically people think about apartment complexes or multifamily, but there's about 20 million single family, which is um, broadly defined as one to four units, about 20 million units that are uh, rental units in the US and the asset class itself is about $4 trillion in uh, GMB. Um, and Roofstock had been um, one of the few companies at the time that had really tried, um, was taking on this challenge of creating an institutional grade platform for this asset class um, to allow whether it was the large buyer that wanted to source and acquire, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of SFR assets across the country, or whether it was just the individual buyer that was looking to buy a couple of properties remotely, right? Um, as, a, as somebody that owns rental properties, um, I had gone through various challenges, you know, like I had bought properties in um, Indiana, properties in Alabama, and, you know, you, you, you don't fly every time to look at a property. So you have to have a kind of, you know, you have to have boots on the ground, a team you trust, they tell you, hey, here's a property, it's gonna take $20,000 of rehab and you're just looking at pictures and saying yes or no. Uh, and it's pretty challenging, you know, if you're not used to uh, this asset class to be able to buy remotely. And Roofstock had been had taken on the challenge of solving this problem of remote real estate purchase. Because if you think about it, um, if you're, you know, traditionally this asset class has been purchased by people living within 50 miles or mm -hmm. 50 to 200 miles of the target property. And here's a company that's saying you might be living in New York or California and you can still buy a property in Atlanta or Indianapolis or, you know, wherever you want. And, you know, based on your buy box, whether you're looking for income, you're looking for growth and we can help you, you know, mm -hmm. zero in on the market, zero in on the assets and, you know, uh, uh, assemble a portfolio. So that was sort of very interesting and intriguing for me. And really that's what brought me into Roofstock and my, as a, you know, having been a prior banker and all that, I spent my first two years working on in finance, um, mm. you know, strategic finance at Roofstock. And then after that, I led um, as a general manager, our Roofstock's uh, REIT initiative. Uh, so we built um, a REIT product that allowed investors to come and essentially buy, uh, get exposure to the SFR asset class by purchasing stocks in a REIT. Um, and subsequently, uh, the board uh, and Jeff and I basically joined on the same day. We've been working together for three and a half years. He's got a legal background. He'll go into that in a second. 
um, the board asked our CEO to look at Web3 and see whether there's any mm-hmm. other innovation that can be had. Um, so the first wave of Roofstock innovation was to basically figure out a way to make it easier for people to find and underwrite properties. But the closing process was still three, four, five, six weeks, depending on uh, whether there was financing or not and all the contingencies that had to be uh, you know, addressed during the closing period and so on. And so Jeff and I really had a clean slate and an opportunity to try and think of a different way real estate transactions could be done. And we, our kind of North, North Star there was to see, is there a way to do instantaneous sale and settlement uh, without this three or four weeks complex process of going through contingencies and buyer and seller both being really stressed out during that period. And so we started with that and luckily, and we'll go into more detail on all that during this uh, podcast, but we were able to come up with a structure that allowed us to do exactly that. I'm really proud of what we've achieved in the last uh, year or so, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, take a pause here and let Yeah, yeah, no, and, 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 and great intro, and I, I really love that. And, and part of the, the thing that is so you know, exciting for us, um, for Mike and I, is that you're, you're an adult. You've, you've been in the financial industry and that you understand regulations exist and there, it doesn't matter what decentralized or immutability or whatever we're going to throw out there, regulations and laws exist and they exist for consumer protection and, and there's no way around those. Um, doesn't matter what technology you're using. I, I, you know, I still laugh at kids where he's like, it's a car, whether it's an electric car or a gas powered car, you got to have a seatbelt in it. And, you know, while it's a really silly way to think about it, it's the house is, is a house and whether you sell it for a cryptocurrency or you sell it for fiat um, or where you want to hold the title, whether it's in the traditional bank or whatever the loan is, you, you still have to apply, you know, uh, abide by all the rules and regulations of whatever county or, or country that you're in. So I, I really appreciate um, that you understand the repercussions for not doing so and that you started with that kind of side of things. Jeff, as we, we jump over to you and, and already uh, you've been outed as the lawyer. So we're going to, we can apologize right off the bat. Um, you know, how, how, what, what was your kind of, you know, history of leading up into, into Roofstock as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so everything you said there about uh, knowing that regulations exist and caring about them, uh, that all hits home. That's, I think, uh, a core part of any Web3 project. Um, you do need to have that, that wizard, the technical wizard. Um, you do need to have, you know, other, um, high intellectual horsepower type of people, but a lawyer definitely should be part of your team <laughs> um, because it's too easy to go to go astray and, and make fundamental errors that can't be fixed, right? I mean, that's the, an illegal securities offering. Just it, there's no way to put the genie back in the bottle, for example. Um, so yeah, my background was, is as a lawyer. Um, I was I did a stint at McKinsey uh, Consulting before law school, but um, then I, I was spent ten years in big law. Um, so it, large law firms doing complex financial transactions. Um, if I had to summarize it all, you know, it's structured finance, uh, credit, reorgs, private equity, m and and then a large part of that is securities and capital markets. So uh, kind of went through the, the steps there um, of becoming a lawyer and then um, was a GC general counsel at two startups um, based in the Silicon Valley, one being a more traditional fintech uh, startup along the lines of uh, the Prosper Lending Club model for, for uh, small commercial loans. And, and then at Roofstock, I entered as GC um, a few, three and a half years ago, and then just transitioned full-time to the blockchain team uh, at the beginning of 2022. Um, so, so that comes with um, a lot of experience in, probably more experience in the traditional legal world than in the, um, you know, the startup world and all of those instincts that you develop as a lawyer in those types of firms where really you're just held to a standard of perfection. There's no, you can't miss anything, right? Um, you can't miss an issue. You can't miss a comma. Um, and anything in between is, you know, likely to get you on the, on the, the firing list. Um, so, so, you know, that it's, it's a certain way of being trained as a professional. Um, and then, Moving into Web3, um, you realize that despite our best efforts, it's actually not possible to have perfect compliance because there aren't laws in place. You know, we're literally doing things that were not considered possible at the time the laws were written. Uh, Roofstock has confronted this in the real estate space 
traditional real estate without the Web3 um, doing business across state lines and running into the, uh, the, the regulations that you're familiar with that apply to real estate brokers in different states. Um, you know, it would be really convenient if someone in California could operate in Tennessee as well. Not the case. Uh, have to staff out a lot of brokers to do that type of work. In Web3, it's even, um, so, so that's an example of some, a, a firm doing something differently, but being able to know what the regulations are. In Web3, we're doing something different and we actually don't know. It's, everyone's taking their best guess. Um, you touched on the securities aspect. My response to Gensler when he says things like that are always, you know, he says, if you're doing the same things, the same rules apply. We're not doing the same thing. That's the whole point. <laughs> um, and, and that's where things start to break down. Yes, obviously, if you're just raising money as a founder to go build your own business, then, then the securities laws apply. If you're issuing a token that has value that's derived from other sources, you know, do they, is, is that the same thing? And that's really where the question is. So we put a lot of time this year into build this year, last year, into uh, running to ground every single legal issue that we are aware of that includes lending laws, real estate brokerage laws, security laws, probably worked with, you know, half a dozen firm law, external law firms um, and, and weren't shy about spending the money that, you know, is required to do that precisely because there's no point to bring something like this to market, um, get the excitement that it's engendered, go viral, and then find out, oops, we forgot something, and actually we have to redo the whole structure and throw it away. No point to do that. So, so we did put in the time and effort. It was significant R and D um, yep. on the legal side, but that's you know that that's what the board wanted. That was what the CEO wanted, and I think that was the right choice because now we have something that can be scaled. Jeff, what good writers borrow, as you know, as a lawyer, great writers steal outright. Uh, has anyone stolen your model and are they copying you? I mean, you, you paved the way for uh, figuring out a, a kosher way to do this. Yeah. Um, the defense to competition seems to be almost zero. So is there anybody else that you can watch? Right now, we aren't aware of anyone that has taken our structure and started to to apply it to their own business, but we would welcome that. Honestly, yeah. in this case, the market's big enough. Yeah, yeah, that's it, precisely. I mean, the our competitive advantage as Roofstock is the fact that we've spent seven years building the infrastructure to transact in single family rental homes across states in different municipalities. And, you know, we can source off market properties. We can buy them at scale. We, that's the competitive advantage that is not easy to replicate at all. If you want to take our legal docs and our smart contract code and dupe them out and create your own similar structure, you can do that. We can't stop you, but actually we're supportive of that because our, our competition here is not really other NFT players who are trying to tokenize real estate. And it's not even traditional real estate players that are trying to use smart contracts. The, the competition is the fact that no one knows that you can do business like this. We, we really need to overcome the novelty of this and make this one of the you know, common ways of doing business in this space. And so that's why it's helpful for us if, if we found out tomorrow that Compass is adopting this or some, you know, some major um, national player. Yeah, we're not, we, yeah, it's a win for us because they're getting they're getting the message out. And that's really a lot of the work that we've encountered so far. One thing I wanted to point out here was, you know, we, we spent about 10 months um, doing a lot of research on the legal side and tax side and all that. Um, and of course, you know, that amount of work was needed to get here. But all our agreements, the LLC agreement, token agreement, and all of that is actually available on our site. Anybody can you know, basically go download those if they want to replicate this model. Our smart contract uh, is a derivative from Open Zeppelin, and that's available on GitHub. We actually welcome people to fork it or you know bring about other real world use cases using these the work we've done and maybe expand on that. And you know, so we're we're certainly. Uh, not a worse to the idea, we actually welcome it. it, it and that speaks to the power of an ecosystem. <clears throat> you know, if it's, it, you know, 
Web three is never is not designed and will never work if there's just a single Facebook that just owns you know this this social media and then you've got Twitter and, and the two don't interconnect. You have to have that interconnectivity um, and interoperability um, for it to be an actual ecosystem. If you guys are doing things one way and, and Compass comes out and says we're doing something entirely different, but it's on chain and we say it's blockchain, it creates consumer confusion and and, and it really hurts everyone long term. Um, you know, Mr. Demetrio. You know, when you kind of hear these guys, these two talking about their intro, um, and and I know, you know, as a, as a real estate lawyer yourself, um, no legal advice will be given on this show what, whatsoever. Um, you know, what's kind of your your the first things that are, are just percolating through your mind? Because as a as someone that owns a brokerage, um, you know, we've encountered uh, di- you know digitized uh, titles before. We we've, we've seen this come through and. Um, you know, none, none have been roof stocks. So I'll be clearly transparent there. But in the three, um, you know, blockchain titles that we've had to deal with, uh, the very first thing we have to do is undo that entire transaction. Yeah. Um, there's absolutely no value to it. It, it, it. The lender will not approve it. The title, yeah. we as a title company cannot insure it. And so all the work that they did to put it into uh, this NFT and, wow. and they have a, like a weird little structure, um, the, first, the first step is to undo all that. Um, I yeah. think... Um, you know, yeah, go ahead, uh, Mike. I was going well, to point I just, out. I have so many questions. I mean, I, that, that, it's really, that's, and, you know, Jay's right that, that practically speaking, it's a, this is a, a one way journey. It's not going to go back down to TradFi and back up to CFI and try, you know, it's not, it's not going to be able to bounce. But that being said, like, yeah. so many questions. Just the liability side is the first thing. I mean, if I have, um, an interest in this NFT or if I own the NFT out, first of all, do you fractionalize interest in the NFT? We so it's only the whole it will take us down the path of um of securitization. security yeah. so or unless you have a safe harbor election right uh sorry could you repeat that again jeff can you have a safe harbor election on under a five million dollar nft we could but but it's still if it becomes a security even an exempt security the trouble that we would run into is on the secondary trades okay because okay. then they would have to be consummated yeah. through a, the, a broker dealer or you know some of their licensed entity right. You know, so if, I, if, if you own a property in, through an NFT in a high tax jurisdiction like Chicago, let's say, um, you know, if you try to transfer the, the NFT, try to transfer sh- the interest in an LLC in Chicago such that it conveys a, a proper shift of ownership, you owe transfer taxes. Yes. You, you, you know that, right? What, what do you guys do? You avoid single family rentals in markets like that? Or do you, what do you do about all the things that are designed to trap people from being able to avoid Taxation. Yeah. So the way the way we design that because we're not this isn't a tax evasion play. This is the point here is to to make the process of transacting homes more efficient and call it maybe even enjoyable. Uh, one click experience, not a four or eight week painful process. Yeah. And, and so that that's the first thing that we're trying to achieve. And the second is to access different types of debt finance through the DeFi world. Um, so both of those are, are perfectly consistent with paying taxes, but the way that we've uh, set it up is we we're starting with markets where um, they don't apply transfer taxes to these types of transactions. So, okay. um, you know, South Carolina was our first property. Um, it's just part of the, the way the tax law is written there, as in many states, that if a LLC holds title to a property, and the LLC itself is bought or sold, that doesn't trigger transfer taxes on the underlying property. In some, in some states, it does, though. And, right. and our, you know, our answer to that is when we go into those states, we'll pay the taxes. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a big deal for us. We'll make sure the taxes are paid. Um, but for these initial properties that we're bringing to market, they're in states where uh, the transfer tax doesn't apply. So Mike, so, I, I mean, the short answer is, you know, there's a bunch of 50 state surveys we had to conduct to go through this process to figure out where we would want to offer this and where we wouldn't, um, at least to begin with. And and to your point, right, like if we did this in California, for example, Prop 13 would catch that and there would yeah. be income for taxes and stuff. Um, fortunately for us, the strong rental markets, um, you know, there's uh, are in the Southeast and Midwest. And, you know, in, in a lot of those markets, we we're able to offer this product. Uh, at least initially, without having to, you know, worry about um, triggering any sort uh, state mm. and local taxation issues. So that's kind of how we're starting off. And like Chicago, traditionally, is not a like we don't look at it as a strong rental market because the taxes can property taxes are high and the cap rates just don't, you know, 
create good returns. So, you know, in, amongst the traditional kind of what you would consider income markets and growth markets, in a lot of the income markets where we're starting off right now, you know, we're basically following the 50 state surveys and deciding which markets to go into. So what about using the LLC, the NFT, excuse me, I have to get used to the parlance. Um, I mean, I speak NFT, but I've never connected it to real estate like this. So if you have an NFT and it's collateral for a DeFi protocol, um, whether they're giving you actual leverage or just composable, you know, you want to lend against your Bitcoin and, and you're over secured, but whatever. Um, it, it are, or do you allow for for permissionless transfer of the NFT or is the NFT still gated in a, a walled no, garden? So that's, a, that's a really good question. So ultimately, uh, unlike the PFP projects, right, where it's a JPEG being traded and that's the asset that, you know, has the inherent value in it. Here, the NFT simply is an association to a real world asset, in our case, an LLC that has the title to a single rental property. Um, and so, you know, in order to comply with laws, we do need to KYC people who are buying these because obviously we can't let money launderers and terrorists be buying U.S. rental properties. Uh, the, but at the same time, we also did not want to create a wall garden where the whole damn thing only works on our marketplace and moving on The way we solved that particular problem was we decided to create a permissioned architecture on top, top of the standard ERC-721 standard. And the way we did that was uh, everybody that wants to buy a property has to first come to our site and mint, mint. a sale-bound token, right? And then they can opt in to get KYC. And we use Jumio, who's a, a you know popular KYC provider that does a lot of work with other fintechs. Once they get KYC, then the whole process uh, takes less than a minute. It's a front and back picture of your photo ID and a selfie. Once you're KYC, the soul-bound is updated with a KYC flag. And our smart contract uh, for the property, when the transfer is taking place on whether it's on OpenSea or our native marketplace or anywhere else, uh, the smart contract checks to see if you have our membership token, the sold bound token, and if your KYC flag is true. And only then the transfer you know, goes through. So that's that's a way of implementing a permissioned architecture. That's pretty interesting. Jay and I haven't seen that, or I haven't seen it. Jay, yeah. Have you seen it? If you don't mind, um, whoever wants to go, we just walk us through from start to finish the way this yeah. process works. So I, I've, I have identified a house that's in it's in a, a territory that you guys uh, manage. I say, I'd like to buy this house. I, I'm working with, um, can I work with any uh, realtor that I like or is it select, yeah. select uh, brokers? Absolutely. You can, you can work with any um, realtor you like. Uh, typically, um, what we would do is uh, in that instance, if you've already identified a property, um, Roofstock would bring, you know, essentially go through a traditional real estate closing process okay. and close that property into a single purpose Wyoming limited liability company. That's the format we have created for this program to comply with everything else that needs to go together with this Web3 home. Once the property is titled into that, we can uh, tokenize, you know, we can essentially mint the uh, ERC721 on our smart contract that's associated with that specific LLC. And then the, um, if the buyer wants to buy it uh, all cash on USDC, for example, they can just connect to the marketplace after they have done, you know, minted our soul bound token, gone through the KYC process. And they're, you know, after that they're verified, they can essentially connect to the marketplace um, like they would for any other NFT purchase, right? Connect their wallet and then purchase the asset directly from the marketplace. If they want leverage, uh, which in real estate, you know, a lot of people like the idea of um, financing their purchase. We have a partnership right now with Teller Finance. And so they have a product called USDC.homes. You could go to USDC.homes and you'll be able to see the roof stock collection there. And any property that's listed for sale, you can request a loan on that uh, property. And, um, you know, if lenders are interested in funding that loan, they can essentially, they'll fund that loan and then, uh, the teller smart contract will complete the purchase and it'll keep the NFT secured in their smart contract vault. Uh, once the interest, and right now these are being structured as interest-only loans with a two-year term, uh, once the interest is paid and the principal is repaid, the uh, buyer of the NFT can claim the NFT back from the vault uh, to their vault. Really, really insightful there. So real quick, and just to take a, a half a step back, are these primary residences or only rentals? These are rental properties, um, especially if they have to be levered. Um, 
as you you know you you run a mortgage company so you know this uh, if you're trying to do a, a loan on an owner occupying property those would fall under consumer lending laws and so yep. this would not be possible to structure this kind of financing would not be at least for, uh, today we, we don't have those options and that's exactly i think you know jeff or sanjay we, we cut you off there but that was essentially the the precipice why we had to undo um other people that had put primary residences into yeah. uh some sort of llc you know that's attached to an nft and i go that's great but i can't i can't you know our, our buyers can't get a loan against that exactly it's, also, it's true. I think in certain yeah. jurisdictions uh, primary homes and llcs may not qualify for homestead exemptions as well so there, there's also yeah. those types yeah. of things that you'd have to look state by state. Absolutely. And, and Sorry, our structure Jeff. is, yeah, yeah, it's the same. I mean, our structure is the same. If, if you were just to encounter it in the wild as a lender, your first reaction would be, well, we just have to unwind this because I can't lend against it. It has, an, And it's not even the LLC, the NFT aspect. A lot no. of lenders won't lend into uh, an LLC structure in the first place. The, the NFT for us is really just a way of of executing the transaction. So the mm -hmm. NFT itself doesn't have value. It's just a way to activate a smart contract that moves the sell the buyer's funds into the seller's wallet and the and the home token into this to the buyer's wallet. Yeah. And that's that's kind of the magic of the NFT, but it doesn't have any value apart from the underlying LLC. It, it, and it's qual it's crawl, it. walk, run. You guys are, you know, yes. this is the first step. Yes. I'm sure that in your, in, somewhere in your roadmap, you're like, all of this can be on chain. All of this yeah. is, you know, done, but we're not <laughs> exactly. there yet because it's, we, we don't have consumer adoption. We don't have education. There, there's so many, Absolutely. we could, we could do it on that road. And it will um, also take a legislative change, as you know, to put title on the blockchain, right? That's not happening anytime soon. It's a, it's, or is it? you know, federal, state by state, <laughs> county by county, there's so many, um, but, but also I wanted to point out that uh, our also our LLC agreement is written in a way that the operating agreement actually references the Ethereum blockchain, specifically the smart contract and the token ID. Because otherwise, the one question you might have is like, how does the NFT actually, you know, like there's an LLC here, there's an NFT there. And right. what makes these two things, you know, one unit That's my next question. That, that is established in the LLC operating agreement. So changing the address by virtue of moving the token requires an amendment which could be automated, but an amendment to the LC to be blessed by the previous member. It's the, the electronic signing of the, you know, by the seller and the buyer. Sure so that. that, that actually, uh, so it, this is a, a sort of a, a side conversation here, but one of Jeff's superpowers as a lawyer is he knows all the best lawyers around. So he was able to find the lawyers that had done 20, 30 years of work on electronic signatures. And we essentially, came up with this innovative way to say, well, what's what's happening in a DocuSign is that a seller and buyer are electronically signing and there's some other metadata being captured about that transaction. Same thing is happening on it's Ethereum. So there's token. two wallets being signed and then there's a bunch of other information that's hashed and you have a transaction hash available on etherscan.io. Put all these thing, things together and you have a binding contract between two parties. Yeah, and, and really for, for, for people listening that are, are maybe mildly confused by this conversation here, I'm, I'm going to sum it up into some very layman terms. Th there's no one that's going to steal your house because you lost your wallet. <clears throat> there's, you know, the concept of like, hey, I, I lost my, my, my crypto punk and everything else can have, you know, dire financial you know, repercussions for people that lose their wallets. Um, but, but a home is, is, is a very much regulated asset. Um, and if so, no one can just go steal your title. Uh, and so, you know, uh, Sanjay and Jeff have been really clear, and Mike, thank you for those clarifications, that this is a representation of the, the, a, a, an actual legal contract that still requires like, you know, a, a real title company work and, and other things to be able to move. So in, in the worst case, you lose your seed key, you, somebody, you know, accesses and erroneously moves your, um, your, your tokens around, like, yes, you should panic because you have a problem. Uh, but no, you, you didn't just lose your house. Yeah. And, um, uh since you also run a title company, you'll appreciate this. Um, you know, when the NFT sale happens, right, uh, there's a new beneficial, like there's a new owner of the LLC. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the title world, you know, there's this concept of a non-imputation endorsement, which, you know, when you're buying in TradFi through LLCs, you know, you have that concept already. So we're just bringing that concept into Web3 as well. So once the sale is done, we know that the wallet has changed now. The, there's a different wallet that has this token. 
And so we can go back to our title company and say, okay, here's the- Pretty deal. ironic, the, the, the non-imputation endorsement. Um, speaking as real estate lawyers, Jeff and I are laughing a little bit at the nerd joke here that you've got <laughs> non-imputation endorsement on an NFT. Which theoretically is going to kill the title industry. I mean, it's the it's it's, it's kind of yeah. Funny. I mean, that it comes up. Um, it take a long time, but eventually, that's the death of the title. Oh, I mean, T title is title and title <laughs> insurance. As someone who owns one, <laughs> I, I appreciate that they've stuck friction into the system for me to yes. have this business that exists. <laughs> right. But right. The, the the technology has long si since existed to o o eliminate the entire yeah. asset yeah. class. I, I have a theory. Go ahead, Jeff. No, I was going to say, I, I think the, the reason that it, it still has such an important part in the process is it's a Fannie Mae requirement, right? Mm -hmm. So to be a conforming loan, you have to have title insurance. And that's really, that's why the system hasn't evolved because that's the bedrock, right? Um, and, and, and our structure is set up to deal with title perfectly. I mean, we, we're not pretending that now you're buying it through an NFT, therefore you don't need all of those usual protections that you're used to as a, right. you know, in, in, a, in another real estate transaction. We do think that, especially in some future state where the title is recorded directly on a blockchain, title insurance will not be necessary at that point. <laughs> um, yeah. But but for now, it's it's back to the crawl, walk, run. We're fitting ourselves into an existing system and and we were able to do that. We did find a title company that was willing to work with us, even though this has the word blockchain and that scares a lot of people. Um, right. There was at least one title company that was that was willing to work with us, and they I, and they I, issued, they, they they issued standard title. Okay, great, good to know, good to know. Yeah. It, it, it is, you know, so, so to me, just to take it another quick step back and, and really bring the audience in, cause it's, we, we can easily go inside baseball here with uh, four people that absolutely understand uh, this asset class very well, but, but the concepts are, are relatively simple. It's the same as anything else. We, we have real world asset and, and we have a just terrible system that was designed a century plus ago based on paper, based on, um, you know, no, no access to the technology that we have today. And, and quite simply, it, it's never honestly even evolved into Web 2. Um, you know, the, the yeah. current residential, and, and while these are commercial-ish properties, they're, they're still residential homes that are generally then converted or, or whatnot. And so the, the concepts that are so hard for most realtors, most brokers, or most lenders to get around is that we absolutely want to adhere to the existing systems. We can just do it so much faster, so much more uh, cost efficient, and with so much better accuracy. But it 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 only works if we're translating them into a, like a one way road. Like that, once they get in there, you have to accept that it's now in the system, and you're not going right. to go back to right. you know faxing the, the faxing and orders in. So, uh, can I, uh, Jay, uh, Jay? I want to speed us up to the exciting go part. You own an NFT. And the NFT owns a single family home that's a rental, so an SFR, in a low burden jurisdiction of South Carolina. And I am renting this house. Am I an Airbnb type renter or is your management company only renting this to long term renters? And then so, walk me down what happens and then let's get to the best part, which is the end of the month, you owe me some money. Mm -hmm. So how does it work? Really great questions. Um, so first of all, on our product, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we didn't. We were looking at all the Howie issues very carefully. We didn't want to have any commonality issues. So it's not like we sell you the NFT and then we take care of everything for you. Instead, it is uh, just a different way of buying a property. And you as the buyer still have the sole responsibility of figuring out how to make money with that property, right? Okay. If you decide not to rent it out, you're not going to make any money you can you know you make the decision on whether to use the property as a short term rental or long term rental whether you're going to pick a property manager or um, in the local jurisdiction or you're going to go with a regional property manager that might be able to cover multiple jurisdictions how much money do you want to put up put in rehab initially versus later on um, what what rent do you want to set up, set on the product so you know you have a certain yield requirement you're able to meet that uh, whether you want to do section 8 or not like all of those decisions as the buyer of the product, you have all those decisions to make. Uh, we will, you know, we have a lot of expertise in multiple markets. We can put you in touch with property managers who manage, um, you know, who have a 
pretty decent uh, stronghold on these local markets and we can make those introductions but then it's your decision as the buyer to decide if you want to use them and and review the contracts and wherever monetarily it makes sense for you go with whoever you want to so at the moment it's not a turnkey it's I'm just going to use you to identify a property at, that I want to turn into an NFT so that I have access to, um, you know, DeFi essentially. But, but it's yeah. it's a it's a faster, cheaper, more efficient way to buy the product, along with uh, a better, more flexible DeFi financing alternative attached to it. But then you have to make all the other decisions with respect okay. to rent collection. Obviously, as you know, a lot of the property management software. Uh, Appfolio or PMware and all that, they're not that advanced and tenants don't have wallets to pay in crypto. So the, that part of the ecosystem will work with Fiat as it as it does with all the other rental properties. We do have Web3 partnerships where that, you know, money can be, rental payment can be converted to ETH or USDC if you want it in your wallet and don't want, you know, that money coming to your bank account. Keep going, Mike. So, okay, so I, I get that now. It makes a lot of sense. Um, talk me now through your marketplace or you, uh, you guys have ready to go assets I can buy. What's the experience been like so far and how does it, how mechanically, how has it been working? Yeah. Uh, Jeff, you want to take that? It's working well. So, um, we've, we've sold one home. We'll sell, planning to sell our second tomorrow. Um, and, cool. and the idea is you know, once you're the owner of that property on how on, on chain, you have the ability to to sell it as an uh, you know a, a Web three asset. So you do have the flexibility to unwrap it out of the structure and sell it on the MLS if you want. But um, a more compelling way to do it is to try to sell it through uh, an NFT marketplace. So the way that would work is you'll come to us, we'll perform an inspection or or hire someone to do that. Um, do some basic diligence to make sure taxes have been paid. There's still property insurance, all of that type of thing. That's a short period, maybe five days or, or so. And then, and then we'll green light it to be listed on, um, on a, on a NFT marketplace. And it doesn't have to be ours. We do operate one, but it could be open C or any of, of the others. And, um, and then you, and then you're done at that point as seller. So you don't, and, and when a buyer wants to, to buy it, you don't have to worry about an earnest money deposit. You don't have to worry about back and forth negotiations, um, you know, receiving an inspection after an offer comes in. The inspection has already been done. So from a seller's perspective, it's very attractive. Um, it's, it's an attractive way to sell and you reach more eyeballs and in a different eyeballs. Well, I mean, if, if there's a tenant in there. If right? there's a tenant, the buyer would accept the property subject to the existing lease. So and once that lease expires, of course, they have full flexibility to do whatever they want at that right, point. Right, right. But a lot of our buyers on, on for Roofstock, uh, Roofstock's traditional marketplace, they do like to purchase homes that are tenanted. Uh, it's, it's a specific type of buyer, to be sure. Obviously, it's not the owner occupant. Um, but if you're an investor and you have a tenant in place who's been there, um, especially one that's established and, and is comfortable with this, the the place and pays on time, it's advantageous to you to inherit the existing lease because you receive a rent check the next month. You don't have to go uh, do tenant screening and it doesn't stay dark. And um, and so so that's an advantage for, for most investors. And one other thing I'd point out is typically when you look at uh, properties that have tenant in place or tips versus vacant properties, vacant properties when somebody's buying it they may have to do a little bit rehab to the property before it's rent ready right um, so some people like uh, tip properties because they can essentially defer the cost of the rehab until that tenant moves out and there's a turn and so you know it depends on whether you have enough money for the for the down payment plus the rehab up front or whether you, want to, you know defer some of those expenses to later do you guys charge a royalty <laughs> or great minds think alike. I was like, "What's this cost?" The uh, so on the on our native marketplace, which is hosted for us by Origin Protocol, um, they take a 0.5 percent fee, and uh, we take a two and a half percent fee for the sale. Okay. Um, but that's the total cost. Uh, there's no other like when you look at traditional clo closing costs, um, you know those things add up, and especially in a rental property. If you're trying to sell it on the MLS, you're waiting for the property to become vacant. There's, you know, some carry cost associated with two, three months of lost rent and this and that. So all that goes away. 
um, you're basically it's a three percent cost and then uh, you're done now of course if you're selling it on open sea they charge two and a half percent and uh on the on the sale and then instead of the marketplace fee being two and a half i mean a half a percent with origin it'll be two and a half with open sea or two percent with list rare, right so how are so you know to, i've got you know again not it's not my active job i'm just i just own it um but you know i've got 50 real estate agents and you know what i find especially for consumers right now that are whether it's rental homes or, or primary residences they still do trust realtors they still mm-hmm. you know who, who should I, and, and once they've understood this you know who's my um you know who should i get a loan through who should i be a title company who should i get to do my title who should do my inspection who should do all these other things and so you know i really want to understand kind of the go-to-market strategy of how do you um you know especially for this rental market here how do we educate realtors and brokers as well because they're always looking for another way to to make money they're always looking for another way to attract new clients how do we bring the existing ecosystem to you guys? Yeah, no, that's a fantastic question as well. Um, one thing we've found in at least recently is with all the turmoil going on in the real estate industry, specifically how that's imp- impact the interest rate hikes have impacted mortgages. Um, a lot of our, uh, you know, we were expecting to see, uh, you know, Web three buyers uh, be really excited um, when we started working on this a year and a half back, and it was still crypto summer. Uh, but now it's also crypto winter. Uh, but having said that, we're actually finding that Web2 buyers who have never had a self-custody wallet in their life are willing to spend a few minutes to watch a video and create their Coinbase wallet, understand you know, that how, how to get USDC in that wallet and how to use that to go and make this purchase because there's interesting lending opportunities on the, on the DeFi side, which is can be done as an asset-based loan because these are ultimately rental properties and LLCs. They're, consu- they're commercial loans and not consumer loans. And so the convenience of doing it this way is swaying a lot of Web2 people over. And I think real estate agents who are talking to prospective buyers today, but those buyers, if they want to avoid uh, or, or get you know liability protection through an LLC, and doing that means they don't have access to Fannie Mae anymore and they have to go to hard money loans and those are 10% or 12% with personal guarantees. Like if they don't want to do all those things, there is a more elegant way of doing this. And so instead of that business being lost, I think you know real estate agents have a real opportunity to um, talk to their clients about you know getting into Web3 and doing it in a slightly different way. It's a little bit of a learning curve, but once you've done it, you know, once you've set up your wallet and you get the idea of your seed phrase and all that stuff, you know, you only have to do that all once. And after that, it's pretty straightforward. And I guess the analogy is, you know, um, when Uber first came out, like, you know, a lot of us who were, you know, maybe the folks who were in their 20s downloaded the app immediately and started using it. You know, I was in my 40s or something. And, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm not just call my taxi guy because I have his 800 number on my phone and I don't need all this other complication with the app. But sure enough, after a couple of years, you know, the convenience of doing something where you just open an app and and you can see a little cartoon car coming over to your house, like that convenience and, uh, la- you know, I didn't have to be waiting 5.30 in the morning outside my house wondering if the taxi was going to show up or not to take me to the airport. So the, the convenience of all that, you know, won me over eventually, right? And I think we're going to see the same, you know, we're already seeing that with the Web2 guys. They're willing to create a wallet, understand how that's done, get USDC funding, you know, like interact with uh, a product that will essentially use a smart contract to complete the purchase, right? It's all like new stuff, but people are willing to do that because there's some convenience in it for them. And that's what yeah. I would you know, really say that real- realtors and agents should be talking to their clients about. I think that's right. exactly right. And, and to put the point on it, it's, it's a different distribution channel for the same product. So any home can can be tokenized using our, our platform. It's not a subset of homes um, that we own or that something special has to happen to. So if, if you're an agent or a broker, you can offer any home that your client is going to buy, uh, you could offer to complete that as in, in the form of an NFT transaction. And, and what's the benefit? It opens up different types of financing, largely, and then you have the transactional, the ease of transaction. So if I'm a, an agent or a broker, I, I would want to come up to speed on this because it's just one more tool in the toolkit. 
Um, it could result in a happier client um, over time. You know, almost we we think that over time this is going to prove to be a better way of, of transacting, but it does require some education. And so the the agent or the broker is in the prime position to kind of go through the handholding, let the client understand what what the advantage and you know and potential disadvantages are, ask their questions, be the advisor. I think it's a, a, a largely an advisory role for the um, agent as opposed to trying to be the transaction coordinator because that part of that goes away. That's that's all be, becoming a smart contract. But you still need someone who's helping you think through the issues. Did I ask the right questions? Did I get all the information that I needed? And that's where the agents can still play a role. I, I'm really excited about this conversation because, you know, while we don't have a perfect system, you guys are absolutely, you know, kind of like storming into the hurricane, um, which is this highly regulated world um, that has some of the most stable assets on the planet. And, you know, clearly you guys can see that the, the goal of where we need to get to. Um, but even where we're at today, I don't even believe we've got to the starting line. You know, there's so much work that we have to do just to understand what this takes to scale because, you know, tokenizing, you know, a billion dollars, I think would be a huge success. Tokenizing $10 billion would be a massive success, but we're talking about how do you tokenize tens of trillions of dollars stably on chain and, and really convert and get away from the, the systems we have today. And I, I'm, I'm, I applaud you, you know, for every, everything that you've done right and everything that you're struggling with. I, I really thank you for the energy and effort you're putting into this day. Cause it is really, really hard as someone that understands what you guys are going through um, to kind of bring it into a close and really for the thoughts about where we need to go in this industry to be able to, to get to those points of tokenizing trillions of dollars. Uh, Mike, you want to, you want to kind of frame that and we'll, we'll drive it on home. Yeah. Um, I love where we're going with this and I can't wait to hear the answers. Uh, Sanjay, we'll, we'll start with you and Jeff will end with you. If you could wave a wand and change a state or a federal law uh, toward a, a better practice for the, for what you guys are building here, what would you try to eliminate or add or build on? What, what's holding you back if you had that magic wand? Uh, I mean, like the magic wand answer is really easy. If, if titles on blockchain um, and you can, basically uh, look at all the encumbrances, all the liens, everything, uh, you know, it, it opens up a whole capital markets angle like we've not seen before. Uh, I mean, even in the absence of that, I think there are certain things that are missing, which we can do. For example, um, when you look at the debt capital markets world, right? Um, anybody that's done securitizations of uh, any ABS securitizations knows that you need to assemble a minimum of 200, 250 million dollars of assets, you know, for it to be viable just because there's, you know, the process of the warehouse line and all the costs associated with that. And then you have your lead underwriter, your manager, your custody, you know, custody, um, collateral agent, this and that. It's just rating agencies. The whole process is so expensive and complex. It requires uh, a scale to be able to do it, uh, you know, efficiently. And, and as we've talked about this before, you can get up to 10 uh, investment property loans through Fannie Mae, and then you know you, you don't have access to that pool of capital anymore. You're, then there's this huge chasm before you can get to the $250 million line where it's all like a uh, hybrid of private lenders and uh, non-bank lenders and hard money lenders and this and that. So even you know without all the regulatory changes, I think there is a way we can use DeFi more efficiently to do these, uh, mimic these securitizations at much smaller scales, right? The guy who wants to do $5 million pool or $10 million pool should have access to capital without having to struggle so much. Uh, even though like we're one of the most advanced countries in terms of debt capital markets, you know, it's really hard for a guy that wants to buy 50 properties to have access to good, good uh, financing. So, you know, those are uh, challenges that we want to solve even today. But uh, obviously, if the, we had that magic wand, It'll be title on the blockchain. You can look at all the liens and encumbrances, and then you know you can structure all kinds of structured credit products around that. Um, Jeff, uh, I'm sure you have other <laughs> legal and regulatory things you would like to see uh, done as well. So I'll kind of uh, defer to you now. Yeah, I would. I, I mean, I would definitely say that that is the one. Um, what, what, what Sanjay mentioned it, that change would be um, would open up all of the, the efficiencies that we've been talking about. But since he covered that well, um, I would say clarity on the securities laws, um, that this is not a security. And I think 
there's so much confusion. Um, it's take it's gone to the point where anything that touches a blockchain could now be a security, um, which is really bizarre, especially in in this type of uh, construct where we're not talking about a pure digital asset itself, right? Um, this isn't doesn't have the NFT here doesn't have value by itself. It's only valuable because it's attached to an LLC, which is attached to a house. So and and there's we don't even have that level of clarity. Um, either at the is it the state or federal level, so that would be the magic wand wish, um, and that would unlock a lot of the lending as well. Because if we can get an opinion letter from a law firm, or you don't even need an opinion letter because it's so clear, then lenders will lend into the structure much more freely. That's fabulous. Yeah. So, guys, uh, what's the best way for people to find you uh, if they want to learn more, buy some properties, or, or uh, you know, start listing some properties? Yeah. So. Um... You can, you know, follow us on uh, on Twitter. Um, it's um, at ours on chain, and then I'm uh, eat underscore Sanjay, and Jeff is I think underscore G T H O M P S. Um, Correct. So those are the best ways to get in touch with us. Uh, our website is onchain um, dot rootstock dot com, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we we're gonna like keep forging ahead. Um, Jeff talked about our impending sale soon. We're getting ready. We just bought another property uh, in uh, near Atlanta that we're going through rehab right now. So we're in fact thinking of doing a virtual open house on that and doing something on the metaverse to bring people in for a Q and A. So those those should be exciting things uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, we look forward to that. And no, we, we we thank you guys for coming on here. And, and I mean, what again, blazing trails, really trying to understand it, you know, and, and, and Jeff, I entirely sympathize with you uh, on the legal side of things, because for everyone that you meet with and they go, yeah, yeah, I understand this. And then they give you their opinion and they go, and we'd love to defend this to, in court. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, no, exactly. that's not my goal here today. I, I want to avoid going to court. And that's why I came to you for an opinion. Exactly. Well said. Yeah. So love it. Fabulous. Uh, Mike, thank you so much for joining as always. Uh, really great show. I hope everyone really has a, a better understanding of how complex this is, uh, but also what a massive opportunity uh, that, that we all really will benefit from, especially again, we're talking right now domestic here in the States, uh, but there are so many countries that do not have an MLS. They do not have any actual registration system. Um, so the concepts you're building today around the security, around the, the workflows, uh, I, I'm really excited to see how those kind of perk laid out around the rest of the world. So thank you guys for swinging by. Why whales? We'll see you guys next time. This is Roofstock uh, with my co-host, Mr. Mafia Mike. Talk soon. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you.